please remain standing for the reading of God's word. The text for this morning's sermon is Mark 4, 21 through 29. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, he knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we are completely dependent upon you. <clears throat> this text will remind us of that truth, so we are aware of it even as we come to the text. Or would you work? Would you work by your own power for the glory of Christ and for the growth of the kingdom? We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hudson Taylor, as many of you know, was a pioneer missionary to China in the mid and late 1800s. Uh, during that time, he established a gospel outpost called the China Inland Mission. This morning, I want you to consider the story of the founding of the China Inland Mission. You see, Hudson Taylor had already served in China for a period of time, but he had returned to England after resigning from the first mission board he was part of. He traveled back to England, but his heart continued to grow heavy for the great gospel need in China. Around 1850, there were estimated to be around 300,000 believers in China. Now, that may sound like a lot, but that was 300,000 out of 450 million people. Listen to what Taylor wrote as he was back in England with a growing burden for China. <clears throat> These are his words. On Sunday, June 25th, 1865, unable to bear the sight of a congregation of a thousand or more Christian people rejoicing in their own security while millions were perishing for lack of knowledge, I wandered out on the sands alone in great spiritual agony and there the Lord conquered my unbelief and I surrendered myself to God for this service. I told him that all the responsibility as to issues and consequences must rest with him. That as his servant, it, it was mine to obey and to follow him. His to direct, to care for, and to guide me and those who might labor with me. Taylor concluded, need I say that peace at once flowed into my burdened heart? There and then I asked him for 24 fellow workers, two for each of, 
11 inland provinces which were without a missionary and two for Mongolia. And writing the petition in the margin of my Bible I had with me, I returned home with a heart enjoying rest such as it had been a stranger to for months. This was the birth of the China Inland Mission. Now, fast forward. And at the time of Hudson Taylor's death in 1905, the China Inland Mission was an, intention, an international body with 825 missionaries living in all 18 provinces of China with more than 300 mission stations, more than 500 local Chinese helpers, and they had seen almost 25,000 Christian converts. In fact, now, over 150 years later, the China Inland Mission, now called OMF International, it's still a thriving missions work. And they estimate that there may be as many as 150 million believers in China. 300,000 to 150 million in just over 150 years. And much of this is the fruit of one man surrendered to God, praying for 24 helpers. Friends, this is just a glimpse of the kingdom of God. This is just a glimpse of what Jesus explained to his followers in Mark chapter 4, verses 21 through 34. Like the China Inland Mission, but infinitely greater, the kingdom of God began as something small and seemingly insignificant. In time, it grew, and it is growing, and its growth cannot be stopped. This is what Jesus announces in Mark 4. And he does it by means of parables. This is where we paused our study back in the spring. Jesus was first teaching a multitude and, and is now gathered with a smaller group and he's teaching by means of parables. To refresh your memory, and as one commentator describes Jesus' parables, this is what he writes. Parables provide insight into the nature, timing, growth, and consummation of the kingdom of God. They're designed to be provocative and surprising. Jesus uses them to stimulate careful thinking and deep contemplation. He uses everyday objects, events, and circumstances to illustrate profound spiritual truths. And this is what we'll see this morning. Now, friends, what else is Jesus doing as he's teaching these parables? He's revealing who's really listening to him and who's not. He's warning the crowds who may or may not follow him, but he's also instructing those closest to him in the things that matter most. This is why we read what we do in verses 33 and 34, uh, skip down there and look at those verses. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. The response to Jesus' parables reveal who's in, and who's out, who truly believes in him, and who's just following the crowd, who understands that he is the promised Messiah and submits to him in faith, and who will be quick to turn away when difficulty and opposition comes. 
we saw all of this very poignantly illustrated in the parable of the soils. And now we continue in today's text where I want to share with you three observations about the kingdom of God. Three observations about the kingdom of God. First, I want you to see the essence of the kingdom. The essence, the core of the kingdom. We see this in verses 21 through 25. Let me read to you again verses 21 through 23. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, Jesus, the master teacher, offers a pretty obvious illustration. In a world with no electricity, where small oil lamps were the primary means of bringing light into darkness, Jesus says something everyone knows to be true. No one who lights an oil lamp does so with the intention of immediately putting it under a basket or under a bed. That would make no sense. It misses the point of a lamp completely. Putting it under a basket would conceal the light and putting it under a bed might start the bed on fire. No one would do these things. A lamp is meant to spread as much light as possible. So what do you do? Well, you put it in an elevated place where it can have the greatest effect. You put it on a stand. Again, it's easy to understand Jesus' illustration, but... It's also easy to miss his greater point entirely, and lots of people did. What is the true meaning of this parable? Here's the primary issue we need to settle to make sure we fully grasp what Jesus is teaching. Who or what is the lamp? Now, there is some debate about this, whether the lamp is referring to the message of the kingdom, which is now hidden, but will be revealed, Or is the lamp more specifically referring to Jesus, who, according to John, is the light of men, the true light and the light of the world? Well, friends, I think there's good reason to believe that the lamp is a reference to Jesus. After all, the person and work of Jesus is the essence of the kingdom. R.C. Sproul writes, Jesus is speaking here about the light that has come into the world with the breakthrough of the kingdom of God. The lamp is Jesus himself. Think again about Jesus' illustration here. If he is the light, if Jesus is the light that is broken into a world of darkness, if he is the long-awaited Messiah and King, come to save his people, if he has, in fact, come as a light into the world, then the fulfillment of his plan and purpose will only be accomplished if he is seen. The light must be seen. Here's what those gathered with Jesus needed to understand. At this point, Jesus is cautious about who is talking publicly about him and and what they're saying. We've seen that in the previous chapters. In addition, Jesus' disciples are a little worried about what he's saying. His own family isn't crazy about what he's doing. And most of the people gathering to hear him have a total misunderstanding of who he is and what he's come to do. Jesus, more or less, says to those He's gathered with in Mark 4, listen, you need to understand who I am and you need to 
see where all of this is headed. It won't always be like it is now. This is verse 22. For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. You see, what is hidden is meant to be revealed. It won't be a secret forever. In other words, Jesus is saying, I have come to be known and my kingdom will be declared. My glory and my kingdom will one day be evident to all. Oh, friends, the public crucifixion and victorious resurrection of Jesus guarantees that what is still hidden in Mark 4 will one day be revealed. In fact, the good news of Christ's death and resurrection will spread to every corner of the earth. And for those who turn a deaf ear to the proclamation of the king and his kingdom, now they will bow their knee when he returns in glory. Everyone will see Jesus. The essence of the kingdom of God is the person and work of Jesus Christ. You are not part of the kingdom if you do not embrace Christ by faith. So when Jesus speaks, you best listen to him. This is the encouragement of verse 23. This theme of hearing is vital in Jesus' teaching. If you go back and you read through what Jesus is saying, there's this constant refrain that you must hear, you must hear, you must hear. Of course, this means more than merely hearing the words Jesus is saying. It means hearing and heeding. Listening and obeying. It means truly believing that Jesus is who he claimed to be and that you're going to trust him with everything, including your life. Now, why does Jesus stress the importance of hearing and heeding what he is teaching? Well, look at verses 24 and 25. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear with the measure you Use it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. I like the way one theologian describes what Jesus is doing here in these two verses. He is, he is stating a theological principle in the form of a proverb. And the point of this proverb or this text is very similar to an actual proverb in the book of Proverbs. So here is what we read in Proverbs 9, verse 9. Instruct a wise man and he will be wiser still. Teach a righteous man and he will be leaner more. Jesus is saying that if those who hear his teaching respond to it in faith now, then more truth will follow. If they embrace the kingdom when it's small, they will share in it when it spreads to every corner of the earth. But if they reject him now and all that he is teaching they're in deep trouble. They will find themselves on the outside looking in as objects of his wrath, not members of his family. When Jesus speaks, listen and believe. Friends, Jesus is not just announcing that he is the light and that his light should not be hidden, but he's actually claiming that this light cannot be contained. Jesus 
is an uncontainable light. And how do we know this? Well, because his opponents will try to kill him, but in his glorious resurrection, the light will shine even brighter and will cascade even farther than ever before. Jesus is the uncontainable light and the very essence of the kingdom. Now, there is what most people consider a pretty cheesy praise song from the late 1980s uh, that I'm not ashamed to admit came to my mind when I was working through this text. Do some of you remember the song, Shine, Jesus, Shine? Raise your hand if you, okay, thank you. Like I said, I think most people have it in the super cheesy 80s worship music category. Uh, but I'm going to be honest with you. I, it's better than I remember. <laughs> Especially in light of what we see here in Mark 4. Listen. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word. Lord, and let there be light. That's not terrible. <laughs> Especially the first and last line. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Jesus is the uncontainable light and the very essence of the kingdom. A second observation that I want you to see in our text, I want you to see the engine of the kingdom. We find this in verses 26 through 29. Again, Jesus, the master teacher in verse 26, and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Like he did with his lamp illustration, Jesus puts forward a fairly ordinary example. It's of a farmer who faithfully plants his seeds and then, exhausted by his labor, he goes to sleep. Something amazing happens when he rolls out of bed in the morning. He sees that the seeds have begun to sprout and grow. And they did this while the farmer slept. He planted the seeds, but he did nothing to make them grow. But if he didn't make them grow, if he was just sleeping, then what happened? How did the seeds grow? How did they blossom and bear fruit and produce a harvest? Well, God did it. God did it. The one who created all things made the seeds grow while the farmer slept. So again, what's the point? We know from Jesus' parable of the soils that the seed is the word of God. It is the gospel message, the good news concerning Jesus. And, and what happens when the word falls on good soil? We'll look back at verse 20. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. Listen, under the surface and out of sight, the gospel seeds that have fallen on good soil, 
they are miraculously growing because God has made them alive and he is making them grow. You see, to connect the dots here, the power, the power of God is attending to the word of God proclaimed. This is how the kingdom grows. One commentator writes, this teaching would shatter misconceptions about the kingdom. People expected the coming of the kingdom to be big and obvious and overpowering. They also expected it to be the result of their hard work and careful obedience to God. But Jesus makes it clear. The engine of the kingdom, what makes it grow and flourish and advance is not the skill or ingenuity or strength of man. The kingdom will grow by the power of God. In fact, if we were to put our heads together as a church family and we were to come up with a kingdom advancing strategy from this text, here's what it would be. Scatter the seed and go to sleep. Tell people about Jesus and take a nap. Share the gospel and then get some rest. And when you wake up, you can have confidence that God has been working underneath the surface and out of sight. Friends, while the immediate application of this teaching is to every Christian here is, as you seek to share the gospel, there is a principle about how God works that extends beyond our evangelistic efforts. Whether it's the need for repentance and restoration within a marriage, or your longing for a wayward child to turn to faith in Christ, or the besetting sin that you are battling every single day, or the coworker who you have tirelessly shared the gospel with, this text is a gracious reminder that God is working in 10,000 ways you cannot see. Under the surface and out of sight, God is working in sovereign power. So dear friend, go to sleep. The engine of the kingdom is the power of God. The third and final observation I want you to see is the expansion of the kingdom. We find this in verses 30 through 32, the expansion of the kingdom. Look at the text with me. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. If you've been in church very long, you've heard about the mustard seed. All I want you to know this morning is that it's a really small seed. But when it's planted, it can grow into an enormous tree with large, large branches, so large that birds can build nests in it. You see, friends, Jesus' point here does not require that we know interesting historical and agricultural facts about the mustard seed. Uh, what's exceedingly important is that we understand 
what this illustration has to do with the kingdom of God. So here it is. The kingdom of God, as it bursts into time and space through the person and work of Jesus Christ, it does so in a manner that is shockingly small and seemingly insignificant. But it doesn't stay that way. That's the illustration. I love what one pastor says here. Christ came the first time in such a hidden way. He was born in a manger, not a king's palace. The first coming was deceptively small in his birth and his death. But he rose from the dead. He ascended to the throne of the majesty on high. He sent the Spirit to continue his work in the world. He will come again on the clouds of heaven with all the angels as the reapers of the final harvest. That second coming will be big and obvious and overpowering. This is the heart of the mustard seed illustration. While God's kingdom starts small, its growth is certain and sweeping. It's guaranteed and it's global. How can this be? How can this be? Because the light of Christ is uncontainable. And therefore the kingdom is unstoppable. And I don't simply say this because it's what Jesus is teaching here, though that would be enough. No, I can say this to you because of what we see in Revelation 7. This is a heavenly scene of the mustard seed in its fullest blossom. In fact, let me take a moment to draw your attention back to verse 32. Look at it again with me. Yet when it is sown, talking about the mustard seed, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. We, we know what the mustard seed is and we understand what its growth represents, but when it is fully grown, why does the text say that the birds of the air can make their nests in it. What do these birds represent? Again, there are several possible interpretations. They might be a reference to Satan, connecting back to Mark 4, verse 4 and 15. This might be a picture of shelter for believers. Or this might be a reference to the nations being gathered into the kingdom. This certainly fits with the picture of the mustard seed growing into a large tree. This might be a reference to the nations being gathered into the kingdom where they will find safety and security in the shade of Christ's eternal glory. I think that's what we're supposed to see here. And that's why this text lifts our eyes to heaven and launches our gaze forward to the glorious scene that John describes in Revelation 7. Just listen as I read it. After this, I looked. And behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is what happens to the mustard seed. Like Hudson Taylor experienced in China where small beginnings gave way to a bountiful harvest, where he scattered gospel seeds and went to sleep and God grew the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, this is what God is doing all around the world including the Twin Cities. Against the backdrop of rampant sexual perversion and increasing hostility toward anything the Bible teaches and a political arena that seems to be ruled by unrelenting wickedness, with all of this and so much more tempting us to become disillusioned and distracted we need this text to remind us the light of Christ is uncontainable. And therefore, the kingdom of God is unstoppable. Let's pray.